Well, good morning and Merry Christmas from the Caulfield House. Merry Christmas. We normally do this, uh, these, these worship videos uh, from church, uh, but because uh, it's just a few days after Christmas, we thought it would be fun to just uh, tape this, or record this in the Caulfield House, in our house. And so uh, we're welcoming you into our home as you're welcoming us into your home virtually. We hope you had a Merry Christmas, time spent with family and friends and celebrating Jesus' birth. It was certainly a beautiful time for us. Our now uh, newly engaged daughter, Alyssa, is home. And, and so all the sights and the sounds and the beauty of family has filled our home the last few days. So our cup is full emotionally. We've had a good time. I, I hope you've had a blessed Christmas as well. In a few hours, uh, we will be worshiping uh, Sunday morning in the building at River Church. But as we have done every week since March, we're making these worship videos so that you might worship virtually if you're isolating, if you're working today. And so we're glad that you can join us. Now, today we're finishing up the Isaiah 9, uh, the most famous Christmas passage that we probably have in the Bible. Uh, I told you last week we were done with four weeks, but I decided there's one more sermon I wanted to preach. Now, heads up, Lydia hasn't heard this sermon. She is really representing you uh, in this little discussion. I thought it'd be fun for her to be able to ask questions uh, like you might ask questions, like you maybe want to ask questions every Sunday when you hear me preach. Maybe I say something that's confusing that you don't understand, or you want me to go a little further. And so Lydia doesn't have a script. I have a script, but Lydia doesn't have a script. She's here just to just to discuss, uh, to talk with me on this uh, on this Christmas morning. I thought it'd be a good way to approach our sermon this week. So let me begin by reading this passage. Uh, Isaiah 9, and I'm going to go a little further this week. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called, and then we have the names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We've already talked about all four of those descriptions of Jesus. And then it says this, and here's where we're camping out today. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. So I want to read that last section, and I would like your thoughts on what in the world this is talking about. Again, Isaiah is, is writing to a, a, a weary group of people, uh, a weary world looking for something to rejoice in. And he says this, he says of Jesus, of this Christ child, he says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of, of, the Lord of hosts will do this. What do you think it's talking about? I think his kingdom is going to increase here on earth. Uh, absolutely. Maybe you should preach this sermon. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what this passage is about today. Uh, Jesus coming ultimately is so that he might establish his eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God, which we're, we're living in now, but it's not fully, completely established. It's being established. It's, it's here and yet not quite yet, if you know what I mean, and maybe you don't. But, but, but the idea is that we are now, as Christ followers, living in, in, in the kingdom of God, and yet it will be fully established over time and through eternity. And that's what it's talking about. That's the promise. So we've been talking about Christmas cheer over the last five weeks. And boy, do we need Christmas cheer. This is the best news. I left this for last. This is uh, like heightened Christmas cheer. The idea that Christ is coming, that he might establish his kingdom for eternity. So this is the good news. This is what Isaiah says about the coming Christ child, this baby in the manger, that he will ultimately usher in the kingdom of God. This eternal life existence that, that maybe you've heard about. Christians talk about it all the time, that we're, we're going to live in heaven forever and we have eternal life. 
but I'm not sure we really have uh, much of a grasp or an awareness of really the, the profound nature of, of, of eternal life. And this is, by the way, a uniquely Christian belief, the idea that we have a Savior that affords us, or offers us, rather, eternal life. What do you think of when you think of eternal life? Never ending. Never ending. And that is the quantitative aspect of eternal life, meaning that it's a really long time, it's eternal, the quantity of time. But the, the Bible, when it speaks of eternal life, it also speaks in a qualitative fashion, meaning that it's really jazzed life. It's really awesome life. It's not life like it is now. Um, and so that's really what Isaiah, where Isaiah camps out in this passage. He really talks about what eternal life is in a qualitative sort of way. He says, Jesus is coming, he says to the, the nation of Israel. The Messiah is coming and he will bring with him eternal life. And here's the quality eternal life that Jesus will afford us. It's important for us uh, thousands of years later because as Christians, that's like one of our ethics. We say that Jesus offers us eternal life, but if we don't even understand how wonderful that might possibly be, then it's not something that we go hard after. So, what it will be like living with Jesus for eternity. Now, before I jump into this passage and, and, and read what it says, do you have any ideas that maybe that you have what you think eternal life, eternity with Jesus, the kingdom of God, might be like? Is, is there one or two things you're looking forward to? No sickness. No sadness. Um, no sin. Yeah. And that's the heart of a mom. Like, when you have kids, one kid or many kids in your case, you, you, you see sin, I'm, I'm sorry, sickness and sadness and brokenness in the home all the time. And, and to long for a day where that is no more is, is, is a beautiful thing. It's something I think we all, we all dream of. Could, could it might possibly be true? So when Jesus rules, here's what the kingdom of God will be like. And, and oh, there are, I think there are four, four thoughts from this passage. And here they are, number one. Jesus will limitly, limitlessly expand his influence and ultimately create peace without end. Now, has that happened yet? Is there peace on earth uh, globally, completely, with no end, no dark pockets? No, that hasn't happened completely yet. But this passage says that Jesus is about the work of limitlessly, ultimately expanding his influence, the kingdom of God, so that ultimately there is peace without end. Now, that's one aspect of this, this verse, which says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Now, when I read that, I always think of like politics. I'm like, well, some people want big government. Some people want little government, limited government. That's not what it's talking about here. It's speaking figuratively that Jesus' influence, uh, his, his rule and his reign will ultimately spread throughout the kingdom of God. And his peace ultimately will be limitless. In other words, there will be no corner of existence, uh, of existence in the kingdom of God. No, no pocket of existence within the kingdom of God that is not inhabited by God. That that is not ruled by his peace. Now we could stop there and I could just I could just admit that if that could be the only thing that I that I get to dream of regarding heaven, just peace without end. No no pocket of animosity or strain. I mean, when I think of the globe right now, I think of it as like little hot spots of animosity and tension, strife. The idea that there will be no pocket of, of strife and tension left, that ultimately the kingdom of God, there will be peace without end, limitless, it will know no boundaries. To me, that's enough. If, if, if heaven doesn't afford us anything else besides that. Don't you long for peace? I long for peace in my own heart. Mm -hmm. 
No one, no one, according to this verse that I read, no one will be able to successfully oppose Jesus' authority. No one will be able to thwart the peace he establishes. His kingdom will increase and his peace will know no end. Imagine just a day of peace without any limits in our house. <laughs> we long for that. Every once in a while we come close, but then there are days where we're just frazzled. But the idea of living in, in a kingdom, the kingdom of God, the idea of living in a kingdom where peace knows no end. Like our best days are really, really peaceful days in our marriage, in our family. But, it, but, but the peace still has its limits. But in the kingdom of God, ultimately one day, this, this coming kingdom of God, there will be peace without limits. Amen. The second, second thought here, when Jesus rules, here's what the kingdom of God will be like. Number two, without question, it is, it is Jesus who will do this. And here's what I mean by this. Not any earthly leader, not not any earthly politician. Isaiah wants to make it really clear. It is Jesus, the Messiah, who will do this. And how does he do that? How does he establish that? He says this, on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Now, why does he mention David? Why do you think he mentions David, the King David from the, from the Bible? Well, he's a, 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 a part of his line, his King, lineage. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus comes through that and through that through that family name. Right. right? Without getting into the the details of lineage today, uh, that's what Isaiah is saying. You're exactly right. He's saying that that this Messiah or that this 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 ruler that I'm talking about, he's the Messiah. He's this descendant of David, and and the Jews they knew what he was talking about. Like as as non-Jews, we don't have all that, that history and that, that, you know, that, the, 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 that hasn't been burned into our, our, our brains like it was these from, from young age. They knew, oh, the Messiah, the son of David, he's coming from that line, from that lineage. And so when Isaiah says that, it's code, like, oh, he's not talking about our current king. He's not talking about any earthly king. He's talking about this Messiah that we've been promised. That's, that's code. That's what Isaiah is saying. And, and, and the reason that that is so important is because, you see, in Isaiah's day, in the nation of Israel, uh, there were a lot of rogue kings. Uh, there were Not a lot. There were, there were several. There were like three rogue, bad kings during Isaiah's life alone. And so Isaiah... Uh, it's important to him that Isaiah did not confuse what he is saying to mean that an earthly king or an earthly ruler would usher in God's kingdom. Now, why is this important for us? To help us know what to look for in the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's relevant also because... We kind of get this wrong in our day, in our age. Um, we, we think that the next world leader or the next president or the last president or some future world leader or some future politician, well, he might usher in the kingdom of God. And, 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 and it's easy to, to get confused and think that some earthly human being is going to restore God's kingdom and restore righteousness. And, and, and I think Isaiah wants us to, to, to realize fully, no, no, it's not an earthly leader. No, no earthly leader has that ability or, or that authority or most importantly, that calling to restore the kingdom of God. It's the Messiah. It's Jesus. It's his calling. It's his job. Jesus is this heavenly ruler, king, who ultimately establishes the kingdom of God in its fullness. There's a third meaning from this. The, when Jesus rules, here's what the kingdom of God will look like. We, so far we've said 
that that his kingdom will there'll be it'll have there'll be no limits uh that there'll be peace without end no pockets of darkness in the kingdom of god ultimately one day and he said without question it's jesus who establishes this we can't muster this up with our own political alliances or our own earthly power it's it's a heavenly power that can do that now ultimately no one on this earth can push back the darkness of this earth it's 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 the Messiah, it's Jesus Christ who only, alone, can push back the darkness of this earth. I think it's good for us to realize that. And the third, the third idea, when Jesus rules, here's what the kingdom of God will be like. Number three, Jesus' rule will be rooted in righteousness and in justice. Righteousness and justice. It, it, it says that, that on the throne of David, over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. In other words, in the kingdom of God, there is no mixture of good and evil. Have you ever been a part of a church or a religious organization where there was, where there was only righteousness and there was never sin? <laughs> no. There's always broken. Because I've been there. Because you were there, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, every time I show up at a church, I mess it up. Because if it wasn't already broken, I break it. Uh, yeah, you know, there's always a mixture of righteousness and unrighteousness. We want to do the things that Christ calls us to do, but at times we, we fall short. Um, but this passage is saying that it will be established in righteousness and justice. It will be rooted in righteousness and justice. There will be no mixture of good and evil. I mean, pretty much everything we do, it's a mixture of good and and evil, pure motives and false motives. But but ultimately, when Jesus establishes this kingdom in its fullness, um, there'll be not a mixture of good and evil. It will, it will be righteous. It will be just. We will not have a leader who has a good side and a bad side or a dark side, right? All earthly leaders, including me, we've, we've got a good side and we've got, we've got some baggage. Uh, but, but ultimately, that won't be true in the kingdom of God. It will be rooted in righteousness and justice. Well, in, in, in contrast, you see, to, to that one of the kings, uh, King Ahab, uh, Isaiah knew King Ahab well, the Israelites knew King Ahab well. He was a, he was a dark king. He was a, he was a rogue king. He was an evil king. And, and so, so Judah's current king at the time of this writing, he was, he was a mixed bag, a little bit of good and a, a, lot, a, a whole lot of evil. And, and I, Isaiah says, no, when the kingdom of God is, comes in its fullness, there will be only righteousness, justice. In other words, we will do right. We will treat one another justly. And we will always do right. And we will always treat one another justly. That's the kind of kingdom I want to live in. Well, Merry Christmas. Guess what just happened? Uh, my battery ran out and I didn't bring the rest of my equipment home. It's at the office. So we're going to finish this up in a different format. I hope you don't mind. Merry Christmas. Um, so the last, last big idea here, uh, when Jesus rules, here's what the kingdom of God will be like, is that Jesus' reign will last forever. That, that's good news because once... Once Jesus gets it dialed in, once, his, once his, his kingdom knows no limits, and once his peace is fully established, once he gets it dialed in, then it's not going to stop. There's no turning back. There's no term limits. He doesn't have to give up his kingdom to some rogue leader in the future. And then the, the, the end of this passage, it's, it's, it's wordy in a, in a poetic way, but it says this. It's, it's also beautiful. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I'm putting you on the spot here, but what do you think that means? Why does Isaiah end with that? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Well, the zeal, the, the, the um, most energetic, most powerful part of the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Yeah, it's saying... Uh, all, all this is going to happen, and then and then he says, and it's the Lord who's going to do it. Why? I suppose because no one else can. 
the Lord of hosts will do it. The authority on which the kingdom of God will be established is, is the Lord himself. The Lord will do it. Now the context, I've already said that it is the readers were living in a terrible time. When Isaiah wrote this, the, the hearers, the listeners, uh, they, they were living in a terrible time under the rulership of um, King Ahab, Ahab uh, among others. And, and Isaiah assures them the zeal of the Lord he can accomplish this. Like, okay, because no one else can. You know, they're probably thinking that. No one else can, but the Lord can. The zeal of the Lord hosts. Now, now that, that mindset, like, boy, I hope the Lord shows up and does this because no one else can. Have you ever felt that in your life? That sense of, this problem's too big. No earthly person. It's going to take the zeal of the Lord. Yes. I'm sure we've had challenges in our family, and we've had to say it's going to take the zeal of the Lord of hosts to fix this. Maybe that's you today. Maybe that's you right now. Maybe you feel some real doubt in that you're going through something like you've never gone through before, uh, and you can't imagine relief coming from anyone else besides the Lord. Oh, oh, that your life story might be written, uh, on top of your life story might be written, the zeal of the Lord of hosts has done this. That's the truth of Scripture. The, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish for you what, what you are unable to accomplish, what you are unable to do. I'm going to read a passage that, that we speak to one another from time to time. Your mom speaks into my life all the time, precious Mary Ann Horn. A passage which says that Jesus is able to do all that you want, more than you can imagine. Ephesians 3. Do you have your glasses on? Do you have your readers on? You want to read that for us? Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Hmm. What does that mean? God's power is able to accomplish more than we could ask or imagine. Imagine that. Imagine that. Um, I like to think that in your life, like I showed up and I was the knight in shining, shining armor. And yet, it's just a fact. I can't do more than you can ask or imagine. I can't even, I can't, can't even do what you ask sometimes. Um, and I'm, I think, a pretty good husband. But, but, but the Lord of hosts, he can do even more, like what you couldn't even think of, what you couldn't even possibly dream of. Like, couldn't he, I couldn't dare ask the Lord to do that. He can far exceed that. That's what the passage says. And so the Israelites, when Isaiah wrote this passage, they're waiting for a, a heavenly king because the earthly kings can't do what they need. And in our life today, we're waiting for a heavenly king because by ourselves, we, we just, we can't, we can't accomplish what we want, what we need. But the Lord of hosts is able to do exceedingly more than we can ask or even imagine. So this is a call in our lives to turn, to turn from political alliances and, and superstition and, and turn to the Messiah, the only true savior of the world, our only true hope. No political figure can ever hope to bring about an era of perfect peace, and perfect justice, and, and, and let alone for, for, for even much more for eternity. That's the job of our King, our Lord, Jesus Christ. That is what the Lord will accomplish. So, so as Christians, as Christ's followers today, we're, we're called, we're compelled to turn from the, the system of the world and turn to our eyes to the kingdom of the Lord and say, that is what we're after. That is what we're longing for. That's what we're living for. And so I've got, I got three questions, maybe four I just want to read them. Maybe we can meditate on them later on. Maybe you can write them down and you can meditate on them later on. But one is this. Am I living 
for the kingdom of God. Said another way, am I living for a king and a kingdom? I want you to self-evaluate and ask yourself, am I, am I really living my life that way as though I'm living ultimately for the kingdom of God? Or am I living for, for other lesser things? Uh, second question is this. Am I self-righteous? Now, that's an ugly term, but what it really means is I'm trying to make myself righteous. I'm trying to just do a bunch of good works and, and live on my own and be my own savior, establish my own king. When, when, when Jesus wants to usher us into his kingdom, Am I being self-righteous or am I following a king, trusting that, that he is my savior? Thinking that you can be your own savior, thinking that you can be your own Lord, that's being self-righteous. Leaning into Jesus Christ that he might be your savior, that he might be your Lord, that is what it means to be a Christian. Now, third question is this. You know, the job of the Christian is to, is to do what Jesus did on the cross, and that is, is sacrifice himself for others. Um, be a peacemaker when others are aggressive. And so I would ask, number three, um, are you doing that job? Are you doing your job as a Christian? And then the last question, and you know, these have been brief, but you can write them down and think about them later. Are there idols in your life, things that you're chasing after other than Jesus? Are there things that you're hoping in this will save me. This will make me happy. This will bring peace. Rather than Jesus, those would be considered idols or false god, false gods. Now, maybe you'd say, well, Pastor Randy, I thought this was cheerful news. I thought this was Christmas cheer, and, and it is. Here's the deal. The kingdom of God is so amazing that it would be a tragedy if you missed it. It, it would be a tragedy if you didn't live for eternity in the kingdom of God. So how do you not miss it? Um, that's the most cheerful news that we can talk about. How can you live in the kingdom of God for eternity? And that is by saying, I'm not my own savior. I'm not my own Lord. I'm unable to save myself. I'm going to lean in to Jesus. I'm going to trust in Jesus and all that he's done for me, that he might save me, that he might make me a child of God, that he might usher me in to the kingdom of God for eternity. I'm going to put you on the spot here, but would you just briefly pray for those who are listening today that they might, they might know Jesus, that they might be kingdom citizens? Yes. Lord, we thank you that you do save us. You have saved us through your son's death on the cross. And you do want to be Lord and, and Savior of our lives. And I pray that each person uh, listening to this video, Lord, would commit their lives to you um, afresh and anew, but also, Lord, maybe for the first time, that they would uh, surrender their lives and, and all that they are to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And, and again, Merry Christmas to you. Um, if you want more information about River Church, if you want to contact the elders, if there's any way that we can serve you, pray for you, help you, then, then contact us. You can send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgb.com. If you want to know more about the church, you can go to our, our website, riverchurchrgv.com. And speaking of our website, I invite you to go, go there now and, and give. Everything that we do as a church is based on and reliant upon your good financial gifts. So go to riverchurchrgv.com and you can give electronically. It's safe, it's intuitive, it's quick, um, it's, 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 it's fun. Um, so anyway, we, we love you and we thank you for giving. We thank you for... Uh, blessing us, blessing this ministry financially.